My freshman year of college, I came across a troubling statistic reported by the U of M Institute for Social Research. In the past 30 years, the ability of American college students to practice empathy has declined by 48%, a trend now referred to as the empathy deficit, something former President Barack Obama asserted is more important and in need of our attention than the federal deficit. Now, perhaps this decline isn't as startling to you in 2019 as it was to me in 2015, given our current tense, divided climate. But as a college student on the inside looking in, something about this finding didn't sit right with me. I can't know what it was like 30 years ago, but when I look around at my peers, my community, though it's not uncommon to find stress, anxiety, uncertainty, depression, disappointment, loneliness, and a general sense of powerlessness etched in the faces and in the stances of students, feelings I've become all too familiar with myself the last four years, I don't find apathy or a lack of compassion. I see people who really care, who really want to help and make a difference, but they're not sure what they, one solitary individual, can realistically do. The dictionary definition of empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. But beyond that, according to Ashoka, a nonprofit for changemakers, empathy is also the ability to grasp the many sides of today's complex problems and the capacity to collaborate with others to solve them. In a personal attempt to grasp the many sides of today's complex problems, I like to think of every person and their unique experiences and worldview as a single puzzle piece. In life, we don't have the picture on the box to know how we're all supposed to fit together. We probably can't even tell what our own individual piece is supposed to be. Without the big picture, we can only do our best to cultivate self-awareness and to connect with one another. The common advice passed down through generations for connecting with other people and developing empathy is to take a walk in another person's shoes. Although this is a great way to exercise your imagination, according to researcher Susan Gares, walking a mile in another person's shoes, contemplating the limitations and learning on the road to accurate empathy, this is actually a faulty, flawed way to empathize because anything you imagine is based solely from your own experiences, your own feelings. It's based solely from your own singular piece of the vast puzzle. Rather than assuming from your vantage point what it's like to be someone else, the best way to accurately empathize, to really understand what someone else has been through and to know what that felt like for them, is to simply ask them and to really listen if they choose to share with you. So that's what I set out to do, to ask, to listen, and finally, to preserve what I'd been told. I created my project, Humankind, a perspective collection. These perspectives, also called creative nonfiction profiles or narratives, are written in the first person point of view based solely on the answers the narrative subject provides me during an interview of over 100 questions about what it's like to be them. To date, 15 humankind interviews have been completed with support from the University of Nebraska at Omaha's Fund for Undergraduate Scholarly Experiences. Each perspective is juxtaposed with a cover survey, which collects the things we can't really change about ourselves, but are swiftly categorized and judged by others for with disregard to the full story. This quantitative data, though, is helpful for eventually analyzing trends in the qualitative answers received during the interviews. For example, answers can be compared across categorical differences to see just how reliable or unreliable these differences really are for, ge for guessing different people's answers to the same questions. Of the interviews conducted so far, with ages ranging from 19 to 29, 10 interviewees identifying as female, 5 male, 12 out of the 15 were studying English or creative writing at the University of Nebraska at Omaha at the time of their interview. Of the remaining three, one attended a different area college and two had attended some college but were not currently enrolled. You might be wondering, why so many writers? As a writer myself, I find that writers are generally more open to talking about themselves, often for really long amounts of time to complete strangers. <laughs> uh, also of note, 12 out of the 15 had at least one part-time job at the time of the interview, but it was not uncommon for college students to hold two or three while they were supporting themselves through their education. Four out, of the, four out of the 15 identified as having a mental illness, including severe depression and bipolar disorder, when asked if they had any disabilities. 
As far as sexual orientation, just barely over half identified as het heterosexual, with a large portion identifying as bisexual. White, Hispanic, multiracial, black, and Asian were represented when surveyed about racial and cultural identity. For spiritual identity, the majority of interviewees identified as atheists, followed by Catholic, agnostic, spiritual, pantheist, and three skipped the question. A quick personality survey is also included with the cover survey using the Eisnick personality circle and the big five traits. For the purposes of this talk, I just evaluated the initial 15 on two traits, which is mostly extroverted, mostly introverted, or mostly ambiverted, which is a mix of the two, and mostly neurotic or mostly stable, with representation fairly even across the board. Finally, the cover survey asked for socioeconomic class, with answers ranging from lower to upper middle and the majority identifying as lower middle class. Now, I know I went through that quickly, and this is not a representative sample of UNO students or even UNO writers, but it quickly demonstrates the diversity I found among the initial 15 as far as categorical differences. Humankind participants, in addition to the cover survey, also have the chance to have professional photos taken of them the day of their interview. Photos are taken by humankind photographer Rhythm of Carlos, whose goal is to capture the interviewee as organically and authentically as possible, as they are in that one moment. Inter er, photo shoots are scheduled for two hours before the interview, and two to four locations are chosen by the interviewee, ideally places that are meaningful, them meaningful to them or that they go often. In addition to places they love, interviewees are encouraged to consider what they love to do, such as going to a coffee shop to study or write. And they can also get their pictures taken with the people they love. So finally, we've made it to the heart of the humankind process, the interview. Humankind interviews are scheduled to take around three hours. And of the 140 questions I might ask someone, I've picked a few that have proved to yield particularly relevant answers for our purposes here today. The first question I ask in every humankind interview, which is also, I think, the hardest to answer, it is, is to describe yourself in just one sentence. Some of the answers I've received so far are featured here, including, I'm a quiet, reserved black girl who doesn't like the things that are expected of her. I'm a neurotic, God-fearing, God-hating, bisexual Roman Catholic who has bipolar disorder. I'm a cynical college student who's trying to fi figure her life out. As you can see here, some interviewees referenced identities that were uncovered during their cover survey, and some didn't, but no one stopped there. They complicated and they added to their demographic categories, painting a fuller, more accurate picture of who they are as a person while distinguishing themselves from others. After conducting 15 interviews and writing several of the accompanying pieces, it became clear to me that every single person I interviewed had at least one major obstacle in their life that was coming up over and over again in their answers as a recurring pattern. Every single person I had interviewed had faced great adversity in their relatively young lives, ranging from moving to another state out of embarrassment for what had happened during a first manic episode, resulting in their first psychotic break, moving from Puerto Rico to Nebraska, struggling to find belonging in a place that feels like home, completely losing their belongings in their home in an all-consuming house fire, getting sent away to experimental boot camps as a teenager, now known as one of the many dangerous and predatory places of the troubled teen industry, to growing up with a loving mother who was diagnosed with chronic terminal illness. Humankind stories our stories do not end like feel-good movies where the protagonist triumphantly overcomes all of their problems and never looks back once and for all. They chronicle something messier, more complicated. Interviewees took their obstacles, their struggles, the themes that came up for them over and over again, connecting their past and their present selves, and they integrated them into the fabric of their lives. Every single person I interviewed had not just been through traumatic experiences, but they had been transformed by them. They changed, they grew. From the deep patterns of their personal experiences and the very valid perspectives that arose alongside them, they learned lessons from their lives. So quickly, let's recap. Every single person I interviewed when asked some of the most difficult questions about who they are and what they believe had answers readily available, and I reckon that you would too. It makes sense to believe that no two answers are gonna be exactly the same. As we can see from this slide here, although everyone had faced obstacles and everyone had learned lessons from those obstacles, no two obstacles were the same, and therefore no two experiences, and therefore no two lessons, and therefore no two perspectives, and finally then, no two people. 
However, as I continued to do interviews, there was a segment of questions that was producing the exact same answers from virtually every interviewee. I now call these questions the fulfillment questions. They include, what do you want out of life? What makes you happy? How do you know when you're happy? What makes you feel alive? What are the moments that you live for? And my personal favorite, why is life worth living? What I've learned from these fulfillment questions is that people want to be happy. They want success, they want satisfaction, and they want contentment. That's obvious, right? It almost goes without saying. But when we ask the more important questions, like how do you know when you're happy, and what do you need to accomplish by the end of your life to feel successful, it gets a lot more interesting. Interviewees felt the most happy when they felt the most alive. And interviewees felt the most alive when, and what follows is a conglomerate of direct quotes, when I can get out of my head, when I can be really present and aware of what's going on around me, when I can contribute to something and feel like I'm doing some good, when I feel helpful and useful and part of something bigger than myself. Those moments when I'm with my friends and my family and we're laughing and I feel outside of myself and I don't notice the time passing any longer. When I'm with the person I love and the whole world melts away and it's just me and them living in the moment. When I'm with someone and I'm talking to them and they're nodding their head and I realize, oh, this person really gets me. They understand what I'm saying. When there's vulnerability without fear. And finally, so many people answered love, just love. One person said, I love to love. So what can we gather from these answers? I've gathered two things. First, despite their differences that we've already covered, every single interviewee wanted something that is encompassed in all of these answers to the fulfillment questions. They want connection. They want connection to the moment, and they want connection to other people. And second, interviewees are incredibly resilient. They had been through really tough obstacles, but they feel, still felt that their lives were worth it. They still didn't give up on their search for happiness, their ability and desire for love. What I posit to you today is that we are already incredibly resilient. It's our community resilience that's lacking. I can't know what it was like 30 years ago, but today we are stressed, we are anxious, we are uncertain, we are disappointed, we are depressed, we are lonely, and we are plagued with a general sense of powerlessness. We care, we really wanna help, we really want to make a difference, but we're not sure what we, as one solitary individual, can realistically do on top of all of our other responsibilities. Today, we are divided. We are separate. We are robbed of our collective agency, our ability to learn from our collective obstacles, our collective traumas, our collective failures, and to transform into something better together. Today we are disconnected, but the one thing that we all want is connection. So, to practice accurate empathy, to really listen to each other, to be present for each other, to show up for each other, to practice vulnerability and to honor each other's vulnerability, and finally, to learn how to respect our differences while we regain our footing on common, solid ground. Then, and only then, will we begin to put our puzzle pieces together, will we begin to reveal the big picture. Then, and only then, will we truly become humankind. Many perspectives, but one powerful people. Today, we are separate, but I believe in our ability to unite and to create something better. I'm going to end with a quote from one of the interviewees. Life is worth living because it's all we get, it's all we've got. We get this one shot. My question here for you today is what are we going to do with our shot? Thank you. Thank you.